Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. Today's program is part of the Presidential Primary Sources Project and our program today is playing at Frontier Hunter Theodore Roosevelt's experiences in the American West and it's being presented by the Theodore Roosevelt Center. The Presidential Primary Sources Project is a collaboration between Internet2, the National Archives, and the National Park Service. It's a free series we put on every year from January through April. Just a few quick reminders by participating today, you are agreeing to be recorded and archived. We do keep recordings of all of our programs on our YouTube page for teachers and students to access later. We're super excited to have you with us and we want you to participate as much as possible. So a few reminders, if you haven't found the chat box already, um, it looks kind of like a little caption bubble, go ahead and click on that. We will use that a bunch to ask and answer questions throughout the presentation. So go ahead and open it up, make sure your display name is what you want it to be. Um, you can change it to your school or just change it to how you would like to be called on. Um, and if you need help with that, let me know. If you want to be on video and interact that way, go ahead and put that in the chat as well. And I will work on giving you that ability once I'm done with my intro here. Again, participate as much as possible. That said, make sure you're being really respectful of our interactive tools. We wanna make sure that any comments or questions that we're sharing in the chat um, are directly related to what our presenter's talking about today. And with that, I just wanna thank you again for joining us. We're excited to have you. Um, this is our website. If you're looking for information about our upcoming programs or looking to find some of the recordings, that's where you can find them. And with that, I'll go ahead and stop sharing and pass it over to our presenter. Thank you, Therese, for your introduction and for all that you do getting this uh, organized and running this for us. We really do appreciate it. Uh, um, I'm William Hansard. I'm a, a specialist at the Theodore Roosevelt Center here in uh, Dickinson, North Dakota, which is kind of in the southwest corner, and it's a place that Theodore Roosevelt spent a lot of time. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, those experiences in this area of the country that he had today. We're actually going to talk about three things. We're going to talk about the uh, person that he was as a child and a young man and how he sort of grew up to become a cowboy and a rancher and the, the time he spent doing that and then how his time in the West uh, affected the way he was uh, of the president and the way that he uh, led the United States during his time as president. So with that, I am going to share my screen, bring up a, a PowerPoint presentation for you. All right, and can we see that? Yep. Great. Very good. <clears throat> so this presentation is uh, playing at Frontier Hunter, the uh, Theodore Roosevelt's experiences in the American West. Uh, one of the notes I want to make early on here for you, um, we're going to be sending you this PowerPoint, and you're going to see that all of the sources we're using are hyperlinked. Those will take you to our digital library, where you can see all the great photographs, letters, cartoons, other sources that we're going to be using, and many, many, many more uh, in our digital library. Really an excellent resource that we encourage you to make use of. And I have one more note uh, as we begin the presentation here, and that's that uh, throughout this, this presentation, I'm going to be referring to Theodore Roosevelt as TR a lot of the time. Uh, it's a lot shorter to say, and he signed his name that way much of the time. You can see here in this letter to his sister, he has signed his name as TR. Uh, so that's who I'm talking about when I say TR. Not that it wasn't obvious already, but just wanted to be sure. So with that, I want to open this presentation with this cartoon. And I want to take a couple of minutes here to, uh, to look at this cartoon. And if you guys will uh, tell me in the chat things you think are important, things you think are interesting, things you have questions about, um, go ahead and use the chat box to tell me some things that stand out to you about this cartoon of President Roosevelt. Horse uh, with the name of Wyoming on it, Hazley Elementary notices. Very good. That is important. Uh, 
a bear in the grass. Yes, there is a little uh, a little cartoon of a bear there. Um, and that's going to be uh, an interesting character that we're going to come back later to in the presentation. So I'm glad you noticed that. Um, that was also Hazley Elementary. And uh, Lilla, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, uh, says he's leading the north of the U.S. Yes, those uh, cattle are labeled with many northern states. And Hazley Elementary also says he has a big head. He sure does. Uh, and there's uh, definitely some, some interesting symbolism there. Uh, Birchwood Blue Hills Charter School says the horse is smiling. That's true. Uh, and and uh, so is uh, Mr. Roosevelt. So that's interesting to note. Hazley says uh, he looks like a cowboy. He sure does. So uh, it's important to note, right, that this image of Theodore Roosevelt, of TR as a cowboy, was something that everybody recognized him as. Uh, it, was, it was part of, of his public image. Um, and uh, like we said, he's a cowboy here and he's leading uh, cattle that are labeled after the states. Um, he's actually, this is from the 1904 election. So this is showing him sort of wrangling the votes of the states to win the presidency. Um, uh, stuck, Hazley says, yes, I don't see how I can get out of this. And that cow is labeled Alabama. Uh, there was some, some hesitancy uh, for Southern votes for to TR for a couple of reasons. That's kind of a, a bigger topic than this presentation get, can get into, but it's good to notice that, that the Alabama cow seems stuck voting for Roosevelt. <laughs> Excuse me. So we want to talk about how TR becomes this, this cowboy, how he gets this cowboy image. But we have to start with his childhood. Um, TD was his nickname when he was a little child, when he was a uh, six, seven, eight years old. And uh, he is born in Manhattan in New York City in 1858. And he's brought up in a very wealthy family. Um, lots of money, they get to travel and do all kinds of exciting things. And he will be uh, homeschooled by private tutors uh, for his education. And he's very, very smart. Uh, TR is a very bright little boy, especially in the sciences and in natural sciences. Uh, and he's especially uh, uh, interested in animals, and he will even make his own little museum in his home uh, with his cousins. Together, they will collect and do taxidermy on, on animal specimens and make their own little museum. They'll even write out the label cards and everything. It's really a, a, an interesting thing that he does. So he really, really uh, enjoys uh, working with, with animals and animal specimens. But he's also a very sickly and a very weak child. His body is, is very weak, especially with asthma. Now today, asthma is pretty easily treatable for the most part with inhalers and, and other forms of medicine. But at that time, it was very, very difficult to treat asthma, especially as severe as his was. Um, and they had all kinds of things they would do to treat it. They'd actually do things that would make him sick to his stomach because that would... Uh, that would counteract the asthma. So they would make him smoke a bunch of cigars or drink a whole lot of black coffee um, and do other things that would make him sick in other ways because it was still better than the asthma. And so the weakness of his body becomes sort of a, a problem and his father uh, will tell him that he needs to make his body, uh, that he can't just be smart, that he also has to be physically strong, that he has to make his body. Um, and Little T.D. will take up that challenge. Uh, and as a young boy, and especially as a teenager, he will engage in strenuous exercise, really, really strong physical activity, and he will go outdoors, he will hunt, he will do more studying of animals, uh, and he will do things that will strengthen his body. And that becomes something he continues to do through the rest of his life. It's important to him to keep up exercise and outdoor activities. Now, as a, as a young man, he goes to college. He will study at Harvard University. He will continue studying natural sciences. Uh, he will also study history and classics, which is like Greek and Roman literature and language, the ancient world kind of things. He will also marry a family friend and a sweetheart, Alice Hathaway Lee, a woman who he finds very beautiful and loves very much. He will attend Columbia Law School. Uh, but he will leave before he graduates so that he can become a politician. Uh, and he will become an elect, elected representative uh, in the state of New York, a New York assemblyman. So things are going fairly well 
for, for young TR as he is making his way in the world. But unfortunately, he has uh, something of a setback not long after sort of setting himself up in all of these ways. Now, today is Valentine's Day, and for many of us, that's a very happy day, right, filled with, with love. But for TR, it was unfortunately a very, very sad day. Uh, on Valentine's Day, February 14th in 1884, his new wife and his mother will die within about 12 hours of each other in the same house. Uh, his mother, Mitty, will die of typhoid, which is a, a bacterial disease, at age 48. And his wife, uh, Alice, will die of kidney failure at age 22. And just a few days before, Alice had given birth to a daughter. Uh, it was her pregnancy that sort of masked her illness, so they didn't treat her because they didn't know how sick she actually was. Uh, and so she gives birth and then dies a few days later. Um, and you can see in his diary here, uh, TR marked the day with a big X and wrote, the light has gone out of my life. Uh, so he was very, very devastated and very sort of lost. Uh, he didn't know what to do with himself or how to go on. Now, before we go any further, I do want to sort of give you a spoiler alert. Things are going to get happier, I promise. This is a very sad story, I know, but things are going to turn around. So don't, don't be too sad. Um, so uh, he has lost what to do with himself. He decides that instead of staying in New York, he's going to leave it all behind and go west. So he had been in the West before. He had been in North Dakota specifically, uh, we're talking about, to hunt bison, to hunt buffalo. Uh, the, the buffalo at this time were starting to, to uh, disappear, and he wanted the experience of seeing and hunting one before they were gone, uh, as people thought they might be. Um, and while he's there, he will invest in ranches. He will invest in property and in cattle in North Dakota, and because he has those investments, that's where he decides to go. Uh, so he was seeking to soothe his soul, right, to find, to find some sort of solace. Um, he will actually leave his uh, new daughter behind. Uh, he leaves her with his sister to, to take care of her and goes out to the West uh, on his own. And he's still really, really sad. He, can, he tells others that his life is not worth living. He tells this to his ranch hands and to other people in North Dakota. But he decides the best thing to do is to throw himself into the work, uh, to, to uh, be a cowboy, to be a rancher, to hunt, to do all kinds of things, to distract himself, basically, um, and to work really hard. And this is, is something that he kind of already knows, right? That he's been preparing himself for without knowing it because he already enjoys physical activity, exercise, working, uh, and he enjoys being around and interacting with animals. So uh, being a, you know, a cattle rancher and a hunter and all of these things in the West is something that he is, he is uh, kind of prepared to do. But at the same time, he's still very much kind of a, a, a fancy New York guy. And if you look at this, this picture, uh, I, I really like it because he's wearing what's really kind of like a cowboy costume, right? Almost like something you'd see in a play. Um, he's wearing these fancy designer clothes and he's sitting on these fake boulders in a studio. So even though he's enjoying being in the West, he still is, is like a, a, a rich guy from New York, right? And he's not totally a cowboy, at least not at first. And with that, I want to give you a, a quote from a letter that he writes to his sister that sort of talks about what he felt his experience was like while he's out in the West. He says to his sister, quote, for the last week, I have been fulfilling a boyish ambition of mine. That is, I have been playing at frontier hunter in good earnest, having been off entirely alone with my horses and rifle on the prairie. I wanted to see if I could not do perfectly well without a guide, and I succeeded beyond my expectations. I shot a couple of antelope and a deer and missed a great many more. I felt as absolutely free as a man could feel. As you know, I do not mind loneliness, and I enjoyed the trip to the utmost. So, again, a couple of phrases here, right? He had boyish ambition, playing at Frontier Hunter, even he doesn't see himself completely as a Western 
uh, you know, a hunter, rancher, etc. He sees himself as someone who's playing at it, who's doing it for for fun, but also is 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 doing it earnestly, right? He's doing it honestly, and and really believes that that uh, he's he's doing something good for himself and and enjoying the West as it was meant to be enjoyed. And it makes him feel really free, right? This is the best he's felt in a long time as he as he plays more or less. So as a cowboy and a rancher, like I said, he's he's seen not only by himself, but as others at first as a New York dude is a word they used at the time. Uh, what dude meant then was like a fancy rich guy who dressed nice um, and maybe even was a little bit of a snob. Um, and so yeah, that term still exists today in dude ranches, right? Where people who aren't ranchers, who aren't cowboys go out and enjoy a ranch just for fun rather than really being a ranch hand. So they see him as a dude and he needs to find a way to make people in the West accept him. Um, and he does a few things. He will uh, beat up a bully in a bar fight. There's a guy who, who says some, some rude things to him and tries to get a rise out of him. And so he punches him out. Um, he will capture some boat thieves. Some people steal his river boat and he uh, will march them uh, over the land to the sheriff himself. Um, and in general, he does a lot of hard work. He's not just there uh, enjoying it for fun, even though he sometimes feels that way. He will drive cattle himself. He will round up stray horses himself, and he will do lots and lots of hunting himself. And so by throwing himself into this and by really, really doing it, um, he and the people of the West come to appreciate one another, not just tolerate one another. Um, and there comes to be a connection there. And that will be important for him in many ways. It will be important for him as, as a person because it helps him to grow and to heal, but it also will help him politically, right? Because he can relate to these people that he has worked with and met in the West. And he comes to appreciate the land, right? And the animals and the resources of the West. So all of these things will affect the way he, he uh, operates as a politician and especially as a president. Hmm, excuse me. So uh, he will eventually return. He won't stay in the West forever. Uh, and one of the things that brings him back to the Eastern United States, to New York, and eventually to Washington, D.C., is that he will rekindle a childhood relationship. Uh, he had a sweetheart as a young child, Edith Kermit Caro. Um, and he will begin talking with her again, and they will sort of uh, rekindle their love, and they will get married in 1886. And it's marrying her that brings him back out of the West and sort of brings him back to public life. And just like he threw himself into Western living, he throws himself back into Eastern politics uh, with all of his might, and he will rise through the ranks. He will be the police commissioner in, in uh, New York City. He will be the United States Civil Service Commissioner. So this is uh, like the people who are operating the government, who are doing you know, the, the paperwork and the nitty gritty of making the government operate. Uh, he, he helps to reform those, those things and make it work more efficiently. Uh, he will become the assistant secretary of the Navy and then the commander of the Rough Riders. So a commander of a group of soldiers uh, in, a war in, in a war with Spain. And he will travel to Cuba famously. You may have heard of this and of the Rough Riders. Uh, and again, he's able to use his experience as you know, a, a Westerner and roughing it uh, to be this commander uh, in the military. On the back of that fame, uh, he will then be elected the governor of New York. And then finally, he will become the vice president. Um, and the reason he becomes the vice president uh, is sort of uh, interesting because he is known as an aggressive, aggressive reformer. So he wants to make the government better. He wants to make it work better. And he wants to do things right, more so than a lot of people do. He's combating a lot of corruption and just inefficiency and all these kinds of things. But the politicians in New York don't really like that. They, th he's, they think he's meddling in their business too much. Um, and he's mucking up the systems the way that they normally would operate. And so they make him vice president because that position didn't have very much power. So if they put him there, he wouldn't be able to do those, those things that he wanted to do. But unfortunately for those political enemies he had, 
the president, William McKinley, will be assassinated in 1901. He will be shot uh, while he's attending a big public event. Um, and so then Theodore Roosevelt will become the president of the United States. He will have all of the power uh, that they didn't want him to have. And there's a famous quote about this, where a senator, uh, an important senator called Mark Hanna, who did not like TR at all, said, now look, that darn cowboy is the president of the United States. Uh, he warned people that that could happen, uh, and then it did. He actually didn't use the word darned. He used a bad word, but I, I, uh, I decided we shouldn't say that here. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so he is. He's the president now. Um, and he does things kind of the way he learned to do things in the West. He is very individualistic. He will do the things the way he wants to do them, and he will even go around Congress to do them when it's necessary. He will rule by executive order more than any other president before, uh, over a thousand executive orders, which was a whole, whole lot at that time. He issued nearly as many as all of the previous presidents combined. Um, and this is because Congress is sometimes slow or inefficient or doesn't want to do the things he wants. So he just finds ways to do them anyway. Um, and again, this is because as a cowboy uh, and as a rancher, he learned that he, to, in order to get what he wanted and what he needed, he had to be forceful. He had to be aggressive. Um, think back to, like I told you about the bar fight and the boat thieves and things like that. He had to, to uh, be this forceful person to get what he wanted. And so he was. Now, I want to tell you another uh, uh, story sort of about him as a hunter and about his public image. And I'm going to throw you a softball, easy question. Tell me in the chat, please, what the name of this toy is that you're looking at in the presentation now. Birchwood, Blue Hills, Hazley, uh, both telling me the teddy bear, that's correct. Now, you may or may not have known, uh, Lilla also says the teddy bear, um, you may or may not have known that this was named after President Roosevelt. Uh, his nickname in the public was, uh, by the public, was Teddy. He actually really hated that nickname. He didn't like to be called Teddy. He liked to be called Theodore Roosevelt or Mr. President or Colonel uh, after his military title. But Everyone uh, in the public and in the newspapers and in cartoons and everything else in the news, they just called him Teddy. Um, and there wasn't a whole lot he could do about it because it was what everybody was saying. So I'd like to tell you the story uh, uh, of how the teddy bear gets named. Um, Lilla says, didn't he save a bear from being killed, hence the name? Sort of. Uh, there's a little more to the story than that, but you're on the right track, and I'm glad you already uh, know something about it. So in November of 1902, this is while uh, TR is the president, he will go on a bear hunt in Mississippi. He's invited by the governor of the state of Mississippi to go hunting black bears. Um, and on their hunting trip, they're finding that it's, it's taking too long to, to find any bears to shoot. Uh, they're just not seeing any. And so the hunting party will give up and they'll go off to lunch and, and decide to come back later, try another time. And so while they're gone, one of the hunting guides stays behind and he uh, and his dogs will subdue a bear and then they will tie it to a tree so that there will be a bear to shoot when the party comes back. And they do uh, come back and TR says, well, that's not right. That's not sportsmanlike, that's not hunting. I can't just shoot this bear uh, that's tied up to a tree. Uh, and so he does in fact refuse to shoot this bear. Now, sadly, I can't say that he saved it from being killed. Another member of the party did have to shoot the bear because it had been injured and it, and it was not, uh, it would not have survived anyway. But he refused to shoot it on the basis that it wasn't, that wasn't hunting and it wasn't sportsmanlike. And the news, you know, hears about this story, the story gets out, and a famous political cartoon is drawn. And you'll see this drawing here, this cartoon, uh, where he is refusing to shoot the bear. And it's called Drawing the Line in Mississippi. Um, and he's drawing a line, right? He's not going to shoot this bear. Um, but a lot of people think this cartoon has a double meaning, that he also sees it as, a, as an allegory, as having a double meaning 
to be against lynching, to be against violence uh, against African Americans in the South. There's still debate now on whether or not this cartoon was really supposed to mean that, but that's the way people saw it. And so this becomes a very, very famous image uh, in, in uh, popular culture. And because of that, there are some toy makers uh, in New York and in Germany who start making and selling more stuffed bears to capitalize on this, to, to, to join in this trend. Um, and the toy maker in New York City actually asks uh, TR for permission to call it the teddy bear. And even though he didn't like that name very much, he decided that was okay. And, and so he gave his permission to call it the teddy bear. And this man actually sent the family a teddy bear and it is in the Smithsonian Museum today, um, that, that original teddy bear that they made. So that's pretty cool. But again, uh, it's this really uh, <clears throat> uh, important story because it's him as a hunter, it's him as an outdoorsman, it's uh, also his righteousness and his doing things that are right and his protection and love of animals in some ways, depending on how you want to view that. Um, and so we want to talk some more about how his love of land and resources and his love of animals uh, were part of what he did as the president. He sees a lot of uh, problems that that uh, lead to him wanting to protect land and to protect animals for the public. Um, in the West, he saw that resources were being overused and poorly used. He saw that cattle were, were overgrazing. They were eating too much of the grass too quickly. He saw that you know, uh, water was being you know, not always used uh, to the best of the ability and, and minerals and oil and all those kinds of things in the West. Um, in other parts of the country, birds were being hunted for their feathers, uh, especially uh, birds that had like really big, clean white feathers like pelicans uh, and egrets and some other birds. And some are actually being hunted nearly to extinction. Uh, they are hunting uh, uh, thousands and thousands of these birds just for their feathers. Um, and these feathers are being used in, in fashion, in clothing, uh, ladies' hats in particular. Uh, are are uh, are adorned with these feathers, excuse me. Um, and so one of the the things that President Roosevelt will do is create bird refuges or what today are general wildlife refuges uh, to protect these animals. And there's a famous story where he asks uh, someone else in the government, is there any law to stop me from from creating this wildlife? preserve, and he's told, no, there is no law, and the, the federal government already owns some of this land. And so he replies with, I so declare it. He says, this is what I'm going to do. This is what's happening. We're going to protect these animals. And uh, Pelican Island in Florida is the first place that he does that with. And then he will create many, many more uh, places that protect birds and other animals. Uh, oh, and one more reason that he... Uh, he wanted to protect this land is that he believed that people needed uh, respite, refuge, a break from urban environments. Uh, cities at this time were very, very dirty and smoky, smoggy, unpleasant places to spend very much of your time. So people who could afford to go out into nature, he wanted to make sure that nature was there for them. Um, now, he didn't invent national parks. Those had been around a little while. Um, but he did create five new ones, and he will protect more land under all different kinds of federal protections than any other president had before and almost any president since. He protected about 230 million acres of land uh, with national parks, national monuments, the wildlife refuges, all of these different kinds of protections that are still being used today to protect our land. But he also is looking to strike balance, it's important to note. Uh, so uh, he recognizes that the natural resources can still be used. You don't completely protect them from any kind of use at all. You just want to use them responsibly. Um, so he was okay with there being you know, use of, of minerals and other things and, and making profit as long as some land was being set aside and some resources were being set aside and so they wouldn't just totally go away. And that was, that was a real risk uh, at the time that some of 
the most important sites in, in nature, in the wild, in the United States might not stay uh, natural. They might be developed for, for profit. Um, and that leads me to let you know that uh, the TR Center is going to be doing a, another presentation uh, for PPSP on March 16th. Um, this is a joint presentation with uh, Andrew Jackson's Hermitage, and we're going to talk a lot more about the idea of preserving and protecting public land and the pros and cons of that and how uh, TR and Andrew Jackson and others have thought about the importance of protecting land. So that's going to be really exciting. And finally, I want to let you know, uh, again, like I mentioned before, about our digital library. If you visit TheodoreRooseveltCenter.org, that will take you to uh, all kinds of resources. You can see all of these photographs and letters and government documents, political cartoons, all these different kinds of things, as well as encyclopedia articles and timelines and lots of tools to help you learn about TR and the time in which he lived. Um, you can also contact me uh, if you have any questions or need any help doing this research. You can call me at this phone number or email me. It is my job to help you do this research. So I am very, very happy to do that if you have any questions. Um, and with that, let me open up the chat to any questions or comments or thoughts, anything that you may have that you'd like to say. Hazley Elementary asks, did he have other children? Yes, uh, Theodore Roosevelt had six children. So he had uh, his daughter, Alice, uh, named after uh, uh, her mother, Alice, uh, who, as we said, unfortunately died shortly after childbirth. But then with his second wife, Edith, he had five more children. He had Theodore Roosevelt Jr., uh, another son, Kermit, uh, son, Quentin, a son, Archie, and another daughter, Ethel. Um, and they all were very, very fun characters in their own right. They all have a lot of really interesting stories, too. Um, they went on to do a lot of interesting things. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt Jr. And, his, uh, and Kermit would also go hunting with him and even went on trips with him when he went to Africa and to Brazil and, and all around the world. So uh, it's, uh, it would be worth going to read some about his children also. Hazley Elementary also asked, how long was he president? He was president for almost two full terms, for, for almost eight full years. So again, he becomes president after William McKinley is assassinated in September 1901. And then he will get elected in uh, 1904 on his own. He does end up running again uh, for president in 1912, but he will not win. Um, but he serves almost two full terms as president. Um, how old was he during his presidency? Birchwood Blue Hills Charter School asks. Um, he was elected at the age of 42, youngest, uh, or no, he became president, excuse me, not elected, uh, became president at 42 when William McKinley was assassinated, youngest person to become president uh, in, in our history. Um, Hazley Elementary asks, did he have pets? Oh boy, the Roosevelt family had tons of pets. They had dogs, they had guinea pigs, they had parrots, they had all kinds of pets. And actually one of my favorite stories about that is uh, one time his wife Edith was sick and so he was taking care of all of the children and in order to keep them occupied to, so that they would have fun, he bought the children flying squirrels as pets. <laughs> and when Edith got better and found out about this, she was not very happy about it. Uh, she did not enjoy the flying squirrels. Uh, is his ranch preserved, Hazley Elementary asked. So one of his ranch buildings, uh, the uh, Maltese Cross uh, Cabin is preserved and that's at the Theodore Roosevelt National Park uh, in North Dakota today. Um, that was preserved uh, uh, not long after he was no longer using it and it actually got like toured all around the country and stuff. And today it's in the National Park. Uh, the Elkhorn Ranch, unfortunately, is no longer preserved. The buildings are not, but the land is part of the National Park today. So you can go at least to where it was. Um, 
which president did protect the most land? Birchwood Blue Hills Charter School asks. I believe that is President Obama. I would have to double check that. Um, but he preserved also uh, hundreds of, of millions of acres of land through national uh, uh, monuments and other designations. Um, Jimmy Carter also protected uh, many, you know, uh, hun hundreds of millions of, of acres of land as well. Jimmy Carter uh, was also a very important president for conservation in general. Uh, I hope uh, I've answered all of those questions well enough. Uh, Therese has put out the call if there are any more questions. If there are, happy to take them. Again, also happy to uh, speak with you by email or phone if you need anything. I thank you all very much for being here today. It means a lot to me that you take your time to, uh, to come hear this presentation and, and I really enjoyed speaking to you.